Great. Well, thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, it, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Karamata UK is, is a wonderful charity for, for the size and the number of people it has. It, it does incredible things. So, uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. So maybe just a show of hands. Do you want to just put your hand up if you have dilated cardiomyopathy? Wow. And if you're a carer for someone with dilated cardiomyopathy? Okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Good. Well, well so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through, but probably won't do a whole hour. We'll, we'll probably just do about 45 minutes, just all the, the basics, and then allow plenty of time for questions at the end. So if we just make a start, so, so cardiomyopathy. So what, what is cardiomyopathy? Well, all cardiomyopathy is, it's an abnormality of the muscle of the heart. It doesn't mean anything more than that. So, so that's what the definition of a cardiomyopathy is. And then it's split a little bit further into the type of heart muscle issue. So you can have a, a thick heart muscle problem, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can have a dilated cardiomyopathy where the main pumping chamber is enlarged and often weak. And then you can have the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies where either the right or left side is affected and you're, you're more prone to fast and slow heart rates. And I think this is, this is quite important, certainly when you're going into clinic and you're being told what's going on. So if, if you look at the classification, you have cardiomyopathy at the top, and then you go down a level and you have your dilated cardiomyopathy but, but it's really important, particularly for, for you guys as patients, you, you shouldn't stop there. So if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy, that's just a description. It's not actually a diagnosis. So the next step down is, do I have a genetic dilated cardiomyopathy or do I have a, another reason for my card cardiomyopathy? So really important to ask the people you're seeing what, what your underlying cause is. If you have a genetic dilated cardiomyopathy, then you need to ask, well, well, can we look for the gene? Can we try and find the gene? Because that's really helpful for the wider family. If you don't have a genetic cause, then you need to ask, well, why do I have a dilated cardiomyopathy? Is it drugs? Did I have an infection? Is it some problem with hormones? So, so, so whenever you're being seen, try and understand, is it genetic? Is it not genetic? If it's not genetic, what's the underlying cause? And sometimes there's treatable underlying causes. So that, that's why it's really important. There's also quite a lot of people who, who sit on this spectrum of dilated cardiomyopathy. Because as you, you heard about Dr. Google, if you Google dilated cardiomyopathy, you, you see really extreme cases. But there's a lot of people with very mild symptoms, with a just slightly enlarged heart, a just slightly weak heart. So there's a whole spectrum of dilated cardiomyopathy. And particularly now, our, our imaging is better. Everyone gets an MRI. There's a whole load of people who who are given a label of dilated cardiomyopathy, where actually they have very, very minor problems. So, so again, just, just be careful of that label sometimes. Okay, but myocarditis is going on in a different room, but just all the definitions are quite confusing, aren't they? So, so myocarditis is where you get inflammation of the muscle of the heart. And if that goes on for a while, sorry, let me go back to that. If that goes on for a while, it can lead to a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, the only way to diagnose myocarditis properly is to actually to do a biopsy of the heart, but actually you can most of the time get a pretty good idea with MRI scans. So, so that's what myocarditis is. And then heart failure. So, so the definition of heart failure is basically where you're unable to generate a cardiac output to meet the demands of the body. And it can be due to any kind of problem with the muscle or the valves or the coronary arteries. But the key about heart failure is you have to have the, the symptoms that you just heard described earlier absolutely beautifully. You get the tiredness, the swelling, the breathlessness. So to, to have a label of heart failure, you have to have those symptoms. And then if you, if you have those symptoms of heart failure, it's further classified depending on this ejection fraction. So your ejection fraction is percent of blood ejected in one beat. That, that's all it is. And normal isn't 100%. So normal is 55 to 60%. You know, significantly weak, you heard, is about 10%. So the, the cutoffs for various treatments depend on that ejection fraction. So it's, 
as a patient, it's one of the things that's really helpful for you to know is what your ejection fraction is. And if your ejection fraction is under 40, you have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 40 to 50 is mid-range. Above 50 is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the drugs we use and devices and pacemakers and things, it depends on which of those categories you, you sit in. And I guess just a, a you in the room that have dilated cardiomyopathy, how many of you know your ejection fraction? Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So if we'd have asked that question five years ago, I think you'd only seen a, a few hands. That's, that's, that's fine. Okay. And just going to come back to one of the points you, you heard earlier. If you Google dilated cardiomyopathy, you, you tracked a whole load of heart failure sites. Now, heart failure is normally due to coronary artery disease, not due to dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is the epidemiology of heart failure. And the average age of someone with heart failure is, is 79 now in the UK. Most people with heart failure have four or five other issues. They're diabetes, coronary disease, kidney failure, lung problems. So, so the outlook for that group of people with heart failure is so different to people with dilated cardiomyopathy. So what you're reading on the internet is completely wrong. It's, it's focusing on this group and this group because they're so elderly with so many other problems have a much worse outlook than people with dilated cardiomyopathy. So if you, if you compare them, and this is one of the most important things that, that people need to understand, if you look at people with dilated cardiomyopathy, the last 40 years, every decade, outcome has got better and better and better. So the data we have from mainly from large Italian registries now is if you have a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, 10 years later, 90% of people are well alive with very little in the way of symptoms. So, so the outlook for dilated cardiomyopathy is really good these days. Whereas if you look at people coming into hospital with heart failure, who are 80 with all these other problems, that their outlook is very different. So, so the risks of dying in three years is about 50%. So it's a very, very different condition. So dilated cardiomyopathy, you know, much better outcomes than those with, with sort of traditional heart failure. And this is the other, I won't go through the details of the slide, but, but when we come to ejection fraction, if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy and you're put on the right treatment, the right tablets, your ejection fraction will probably go up by about 15%. So that's when, you know, if you've got a low ejection fraction and people are saying, oh, let's think about a, a pacemaker or a defibrillator, you, you need to wait three or six months most of the time because a lot of the time you, you see a really significant improvement. And we heard a, a great example earlier, didn't we? So, 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 you know, wait before you have your defibrillator or your pacemaker. Because you often see a really good improvement with these medicines. Okay, so this is what, what, what it looks like when we do the imaging of the heart. Um, so this is an MRI scan. This is an echo on the bottom. So this is the left ventricle there. That's the normal heart. You can see it contracting pretty vigorously. And that's, I think that the video is a difficult, but, but that's a, a heart that's bigger than it is and is weaker in the way it's pumping. I wonder if I can just get that. No, I don't. Okay. And there you can see on the top as well, here you have a heart that's bigger than it should be, and it's just not quite pumping as well as it should be. So we'll... We'll maybe see if I can show that again. Sorry, they're quite big files. No, I don't think they're going to. Okay. And this is the, the difference between a dilated cardiomyopathy here on the left, and this is what a restrictive cardiomyopathy looks like, where you have a, a heart where the muscle is thickened, but it's still a normal size and still pumping function is normal. So that's what you see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloid, other conditions like that. Okay. And then does, does anyone in the room have an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Yeah. So, so this is, again, this is a, where things have changed quite a bit in the last three or four years. So, so initially, the, there was this thing called right ventricular cardiomyopathy, where you have a cardiomyopathy affecting the right side of the heart. Um, often with fast heart rates, often prone to, to 
these ventricular arrhythmias. And then we realize that actually often it affects the left side as well. And then over the last few years, often it only affects the left side. So this is a group of conditions that we don't call right ventricular cardiomyopathy anymore. We call it arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So it can affect the right or the left side or both. Typically has quite a bit of scar in the heart, which is what makes it arrhythmic. It's that scar that you get little sort of re-entry circuits around that gives you the arrhythmias. And this is just some of the genes that, that can cause it. So the, the ones that affect the right are things like desmoglobin, placophilin, and then the desmoplakin and filamin and lamin are some of the ones on the left side. And these are often types of cardiomyopathy where you're more prone to dangerous heart rhythms. So often more likely to get defibrillators put in to, to keep people safe. Um, how many people in the room have a pacemaker or defibrillator? Gosh, yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Okay, well. So this is now what happens when you have one of these arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. This is the right side of the heart. Do you see that's hardly pumping at all? So that's a very extreme example of a right ventricular predominant right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And that's just a very subtle manifestation which you often see when you screen families. And this is what you see with, when you have left-sided involvement. So this is an MRI scan, and probably a lot of you have had MRIs. They, they often give you that injection of gadolinium, and that's, that's a dye that picks up scar in the heart. That's why we give the gadolinium. And this sort of white streak here and there, that's what scar looks like on MRI. So that's why they're giving you that, that gadolinium. And this is what you see with the left ventricular involvement. You see scar, you see this propensity to, to fast heart rates. Okay, so that's a little bit about all, all the different terminology. And it is confusing, and it's particularly confusing because it seems to change every few years. Okay, and now this is the, the epidemiology. So, so dilated cardiomyopathy is really common, and I think about one in 300 of the population probably has it, if you have a sort of fairly generous sort of description of how you diagnose it. So there's probably about 250,000 people in the UK who potentially have it. And I think probably only about 30% realize they've got it. And that's because most people do quite well, actually, and don't have the symptoms and, and don't present. <coughs> OK, so if we go back to, to what I was talking about, if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, that's just a description. So you've got to know what, what the cause is. And if you take all types of cardiomyopathy, so coronary artery disease is the commonest cause. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy is the second commonest cause. And then you have valve problems, high blood pressure. So they're all the main causes of a heart that's, that's dilated and weak. And then if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy, I'm not going to go through this, but here are some of the causes of a dilated cardiomyopathy. So if you look at the broad sort of boxes there, You've got genetic causes, infection, often viral infections. You've got systemic things, often autoimmune diseases, toxic causes, drugs, endocrine, peripartum. So, so you know, important for, for all of you with dilated cardiomyopathy to know which, which of those boxes do you fit in. And often, and there's quite a lot of people where there's nothing in the family, there's no obvious underlying cause, and that gets labeled as, as idiopathic, it just means we don't know the cause. But actually in that group, it's often genetic. So even when you have that label, it's really important to, to look at the rest of the family because it often is genetic. It's just people don't know they've got it because they're well. And you'd, in the old days, everyone with dilated cardiomyopathy they used to have an angiogram to, to make sure the coronary arteries were okay. So, so you don't need that anymore. You can, if, if your MRI scan doesn't show any of this heart attack, so that's what a heart attack looks like on MRI. Do you see a thin wall with that bright white scar? If you don't have that, almost certainly it's not due to coronary artery disease. So you, unless you're getting chest pain when you do things, you don't need an angiogram. It's just, just unnecessary risk. And if you do need an angiogram, you're not sure, actually, this is a... A CT scan, you just get beautiful pictures with CT these days. So you don't really need to, to go up the leg or the wrist. You can get the answer from CT if you really want to be sure about the coronary arteries. Okay. And then, kind of, when you go to your outpatients, when you 
see your doctor, your nurse, your genetic counsellor. There's, there's various different bits to, to how we should manage and look after your cardiomyopathy. So, so there's the genetic side of things. So is it genetic? Do we need to look for the underlying gene? Are we checking the rest of the family? And then there's the insurance side of things. Um, then there's the risk of complications. So you always need to think, is there a risk of sudden death? You know, do you need to put a defibrillator in? And that, that's a, a very small number, but as you see in this room, it's, it's not uncommon. Is there a risk of the heart getting progressively weaker? Is there a risk of infection? And then you need to target the symptoms. Are you breathless? Are you swollen? Do you need more diuretics? You need to focus on the valves as well. Because often with, with dilated cardiomyopathy, where that ventricle gets bigger, the left or the right side, it pulls the valves apart. You often get secondary leaks through the valves. And these days, there's some really good techniques. You can clip valves by going up through the leg now. So there's some really good and new treatments for, for that kind of issue. Um, need to be sure about the blood supply and also think about the electrics. Are you getting fast heart rates from the main pumping chamber? Um, do you have atrial fibrillation? Does anyone in the room with atrial fibrillation? Yeah, it's a common. So probably a third of people with a, a weak heart will have atrial fibrillation at some point. And it's safe. It doesn't affect your outlook. But the, the key thing is the blood thinners to prevent the risk of stroke. So is anyone on warfarin for atrial fibrillation? Yeah, so, so if, there's, if you don't have bad valve problems for other reasons, so, so there's the newer, newer warfarin-like things called oral, no, novel oral anticoagulants, so edoxaban, pixaban. So you don't have to measure the, the warfarin levels. They're probably a little bit safer. So if you're on warfarin just for, for AF and not for anything else, it's worth asking your GP if, if you can switch to one of these newer tablets. Just much less effort and, and probably a little bit safer, actually. Okay, so genetics. So this is, there's a lot of, lot of different genes involved. This is some of them, which I, I won't go through. But there's, there's probably about 120 genes we can now look for that, that cause dilated cardiomyopathy. And, and when you're thinking about doing genetic testing, you, you've got to think about the accuracy of it. So, so there's a few different bits to it. So one is, what's the chance of finding a definite disease-causing gene? So if you have long QT syndrome, it's pretty high. If you have Hochum, it's, it's pretty good. It's about 60%. It's not as good as that in dilated cardiomyopathy. The, the pickup rate's probably about one in three if you ran the whole panel we can. And then you, you find the definite disease-causing mutations, which is really helpful. But more often, you find these variants of unknown significance. So you have a, a spelling mistake in the gene. And actually, it might cause a problem, it might not, and we're not quite sure. And sometimes you then see how it segregates in the family. But you can't use that. It, it's not a, not a result you can use. And we see a lot of that in dilated cardiomyopathy. And we see a lot of subtle missense mutations in this big gene called Titan. And we're still not quite sure what that means. I don't know if any of you know if you've got Titan mutations. But yeah, that... We know more than we did, but, but it, often it's a modifier gene, and there's often other things going on with, with Titan. Um, but, but when we do genetic testing, the main reason is so we can screen that the rest of the family. Because if you get, say you've got children and you've got dilated cardiomyopathy, we would screen them yearly through adolescence, then every three years until they're 40, then every five years till they're 70. So it's a whole lifetime of, of monitoring. But if you find the definite gene and they don't carry it, then they don't need any more testing. So that's, that's where genetic testing is, is really useful. Okay. And again, this is important. A lot of people, you talk to them about genetic testing and they'll say, oh, I don't need to, to test sort of brothers, sisters, children because I've got very mild disease. And it doesn't work like that because you, you have your mutation, which is here, and you have all these other factors that interplay to give you what your heart is doing and what it looks like. So within the same family, you can have people with really bad disease and with really very, very minor disease. So, so it's important when you're thinking about screening, there's no guarantee if you have the same gene, it'll produce the same effects. And that works the other way. If you've got significant problem, 
often when you check wider family, they have much less severe disease. So, so, so really important to know that. And then in terms of you guys and individuals, we, we always used to say actually genetic testing is only for the family. Um, but actually that's changing these days. So there's now a series of genes that, that we're finding that actually do have prognostic value. And there's some genes that have more prognostic value than your rejection fraction and all the other things we measure. So there's things, and this is just some of the data showing how your genotype can split your, your outcomes. So there's things like lamin genes, filamine genes, some of the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy genes. That, that puts you at a higher risk, and that changes how we treat you these days. Normally, it just lowers the, the threshold for putting in defibrillators. Um, so so it, does, it does have prognostic value these days, and that's quite a new thing over the last few years. Okay, so, so in terms of family screening, it, again, when, when you're talking to your family and you're talking through screening, they, they need to know that the risks. So, so if, if you're from a family where, you know, sister, brother, uncle, aunt, and father all have a dilated cardiomyopathy, then that'll be autosomal dominant. So first-degree relatives will have a 50-50 chance. And if you have the gene, you normally express it to some degree. It might be very subtle. You might not have symptoms, but you normally see it expressed. If no one in the family is affected and there's not a clear underlying cause, if you screen first-degree relatives, there's about a one in three chance you'll pick up an imaging abnormality. And in that group, there's then a one in three chance that it'll develop to such an extent you need to treat it. So, so, so that the outcomes for screening your family is very different depending on whether other people are affected. So if there's clearly other people in the family, they have a 50-50 chance. And again, often if they're affected, only a third of the time you'll need drugs or other things. But if there's no one else in the family and you screen, the odds of picking up something that you need to treat is only about one in nine. So it's less than, than people think. Um, Okay, and then how about the management of dilated cardiomyopathy? So, so three bits, the non-pharmacological management, drugs, and, and devices. Okay, so heart failure nurses are fantastic. How, how many people here have a heart failure nurse involved in their care? Yeah, so probably about half of you don't, but by the looks of it. So, so they're, they're a wonderful resource. Um, so, so if you have symptoms with your dilated cardiomyopathy, if you have an ejection fraction that's under 40% and you don't have a heart failure nurse, then, then ask your GP, ask your cardiologist, can I access a heart failure nurse? Because it's, it's the education, it's the support, it's where you go to when, when you have questions. So, so do ask if, if you haven't got one. Um, and then cardiac rehab. Um, who here has been through cardiac rehab? Yeah, and again, if, if you haven't, and again, probably over half of you haven't, it, and those of you that have, did you, did you find it useful? Yeah, yeah, I think most people do. Most people find it really helpful. So again, if you haven't been through cardiac rehab, ask your GP normally these days. It's mainly community. There was a lot of virtual rehab in COVID, but they're moving back to, to, to non-virtual. And those exercise sessions where they take you through exercise is really helpful. So, so again, if you haven't, been through cardiac rehab, you know, even if you think you're fit and healthy, you, you still get a lot of useful information out of it. So what are the other non-pharmacological measures? Um, so, so keep an eye on your weight if you're prone to, to putting on fluid, but, but don't worry about it if you're not. Um, you know, sensible amounts of, of alcohol, don't, don't smoke. Um, be careful of very high altitudes if you get breathless. Um, immunizations are important, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And I'll come back to exercise. Okay, this is just some of the general management. So again, I won't go through this, but, but removing aggravating factors is really important. So lots of non-steroidal tablets aren't good for you. Some other medicines are, are bad if you have a weak heart. Too much alcohol is toxic for the heart. A little bit's fine, but, but don't have too much alcohol. Um, yeah. Okay. 
And then you, you need to have, you need to be part of a multidisciplinary strategy. So you should all be part, there should be a, a team that looks after you. And that, and we know that improves outcomes. People live longer if you have this multidisciplinary team. So that's a heart failure nurse, a physio, a dietitian, rehab, all that side, all looking after you holistically. So that's a really important part of the, the overall treatment. And that's just something on cardiac rehab. So there's a study showing that actually you, your outcomes are probably better if you do go through cardiac rehab. Okay, so, so when we come to think of the, the medicines, we, we need to know the ejection fraction. And, and we need to know it accurately. And you, you don't always see it clearly on echo. So if you don't get a clear picture, a clear window on echo, then you can give echo contrast, which is very safe, very easy. That's what that looks like. You can give contrast through 3D. Um, and you can do an MRI these days. Um, and the, the, the scanners, the bores are getting bigger, so they're not quite as claustrophobic as they used to be. So we, we need an accurate ejection fraction. And then when we're thinking of why we give the drugs, so, so when your heart's weak, you're not pumping enough blood around the body, um, and your body thinks you're bleeding because that's evolution, because that's how you survived in, in the old days. So what the body then does is it produces these hormones. So you get these renin, angiotensin, aldosterone hormones. So they try and keep salt and water because they think you're bleeding and you activate your sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response. So they're all activated when you have a weak heart. And all those hormones cause progressive weakness and damage to the heart. So all those tablets we're giving you, the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, they're stopping the, the bad effects of those hormones that are being released when they shouldn't be. So that's how the tablets you're on work, and that's how they have the you know, quite dramatic effects they do. So, so this is, this is the, the slightly older guidelines of, of how we treated sort of heart failure when you have a reduced ejection fraction. So, so first step in that, it says diuretic. So if you're breathless, you heard about needing pillows to, to sleep, if your ankles are swollen, then diuretics are brilliant. They, they get the fluid off, you feel much better. Once you're better, as you're getting the treatments that make your heart get stronger, you can often stop the diuretics. So if you're on diuretics, every time you see your cardiologist say, do I need this dose? Can I reduce it? Can I stop it? You know, if you're still breathless or got symptoms, maybe not. But if you're feeling well, most of the time we can stop the diuretics. It's just to get that fluid off at the beginning. And then once you've decided on diuretics, the next step is ACE inhibitors and beta blockers but for everyone with an ejection fraction under 40%. And then what we used to say is once you're on the top dose of that, you get spironolactone or a pleronone if you're still symptomatic and your heart hasn't improved. So that's how we used to do it. We, we've, we've now extrapolated based on reasonable but not perfect evidence. So, so now what happens is anyone with reduced ejection fraction gets all four of these drugs. So they get an ACE inhibitor or Infresto, they get beta blocker, they get a pleronone, and they get dapagliflozin. So now everyone coming in tends to get all four of those. And the jury's out a little bit. Some people would still say, if you have your ACE inhibitor and beta blocker and improve really well, and your ejection fraction gets to near normal, and you've got no symptoms, actually you may not get much benefit from the other two. So, so it is a, it's a sort of very individual decision to discuss with your cardiologist. Um, so so how, how many people in the room are on ACE inhibitors? Yeah, and how many people are on Entresto? Yeah, so, so the, the, I mean, the, the data is probably better for Entresto, but it's probably only better if you're symptomatic and you've got a high BMP and things. So if you're on an ACE and you're absolutely fine, that, then you should stay on an ACE inhibitor. But if you're on an ACE inhibitor and you're still getting some symptoms, it's worth thinking about switching to, to Entresto. So it works like an ACE inhibitor, but it's got an additional arm to it that has nitric oxide releasing properties. Um, and when you're symptomatic with a high BMP, your outcomes are probably twice as good. So again, wor worth asking that question if you are symptomatic. Um, 
everyone on a beta blocker? Yeah. Do, do, do people struggle? Do you get symptoms? Do you get tiredness, cold at the edges with your beta blockers? Yeah. So, so again, it, it's, a lot of people don't, but, but some people do struggle with it. There's a beta blocker called nabivalol that's often much better tolerated if you're getting symptoms and side effects with your beta blocker. Um, anyone here on nabivalol? Yeah, it's a good. It's, it's probably my favourite one now. It, it works. The, the the side effect profile, I think, is better. So, so nibivalol. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so now, a lot of the time, we, we'll start with all four of these um, drugs, and then what we need to do is decide. Once you've had the drugs, we've given it three months to improve. What's your ejection fraction doing? What are your symptoms? Do, do you need a pacemaker or defibrillator at, at that point. Okay. And these are some of the other bits on management. Do, so it's, this slides will be available, won't they, on this, I guess on YouTube and things so people can, because there's a lot of detail in these slides which you can maybe go and have a look off, uh, offline. But, but the other bits we look at is if people still have symptoms and a reduced ejection fraction, if your heart rate's quick, we sometimes add in something called evabradine. If you're Afro-Caribbean, we add in something called hydralazine and nitrates. Um, if you've got the leaky valve, we sometimes put a clip on it. If you've got significant coronary artery disease and chest pain, we can put stents in. So there's a, a whole gamut of, of different, different treatments there. Uh, and the treatments work incredibly well. So this is, this is a heart failure population, so it's not really attributable to dilated cut obviously, but it just illustrates the effect. So if you're 80 and you come into hospital with heart failure, your risk of dying in a year is, is about 60%. If you give all the drugs, the devices and everything, that comes down to about 5%. And there's nothing else in medicine that has that much of an effect on people's mortality. So if you look at all the things for primary angioplasty for heart attacks, that brings an absolute mortality down from 7 to 6% compared to thrombolysis. So a 1% change in absolute mortality. You know, this is a 50% change in one-year mortality. So the, the effects of these drugs is, is absolutely phenomenal. And it, as well as the trial data, which that was, we, we have the heart failure audit, so everyone who's admitted with heart failure in the UK goes into a national audit. And we can see similar thing in real world data. The outcomes are so much better when people have, have the right medicines. Okay, so just a little bit on, on dapagliflozin. This is one of the, probably the newest drug at the moment. Um, who, who in the room's on dapagliflozin? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, so anyone had any problems with it? Hmm? Yeah, no, you, you do. And, and actually, if you're on diuretics, you, you can normally reduce them if you, if you take dapagliflozin. It tends to be pretty well tolerated, though, and it's, you know, it's, it's outcome, so it, you know, it definitely makes you live longer across the whole spectrum of, of weakness of the heart. So if you're not on dapagliflozin, at the moment, it's only prescribed if your ejection fraction is under 40%, and your renal function has to be reasonable, doesn't have to be perfect. But there is data that you benefit no matter what your ejection fraction. So I think over the next few years, even if you've got a, a reasonable or a good ejection fraction, you, you should be prescribed dapagliflozin. And actually, I can show you that. So this is looking at outcome in terms of mortality or hospitalization with ejection fraction. So normal here, weak here. And you can see, actually, as you get to normal here, your, the outcomes get even better again. So across the whole spectrum of ejection fraction, dapagliflozin gives you, you know, clear improvement in outcomes. Um, okay, anyone had intravenous iron? Yeah, really important. Again, often forgotten by, by busy cardiologists, but if you have any type of symptomatic cardiomyopathy, get your, your iron levels measured, so you need what, transferrin saturations and ferritin. And if they're low, even if you're not anemic, you, you feel better. And actually, there's a, an Ironman study just been published in the last few weeks. Your outcomes are better as well. 
So if you haven't had your iron levels checked, maybe next time you're seeing, see if they can check your iron levels. And this is something I often get asked, is, is can, we stop, can we stop the medicines? Because you, you're symptomatic, you get started on the medicines, and then things improve and you feel much better. So the question comes, can, can we stop them now? So you can definitely stop the diuretics, but unfortunately the data seems to be that if you stop the other ones, there's a reasonable chance things will get worse again. So unfortunately the, the medicines, the ACE beta blockers, is a, a long-term treatment, I'm afraid. Okay, so again, di diuretics, you know, if you're well, try and stop and get off the diuretics. All they do is drop your blood pressure, affect your kidneys, give you gout. So if you can, if you can get off them, try and, try and get off them. Um, but if you need them, you need them. And if you are getting quite a bit of swelling and edema, then often it's using a combination is the most effective. So rather than massive doses of furosemide, often if you add a a thiazide, metolazone, or benzoflumethazide with the aplerinone, that, that gives you a much better response. And metolazone is, is really effective if you're struggling with fluid. Um, does anyone take metolazone? Yeah. Okay, that's a good sign. Okay, um, me mental health issues. So this is incredibly important in, in heart failure, in cardiomyopathy, in any kind of cardiovascular problem. So, so if you look at the rate of depression, if you have symptomatic cardiomyopathy, probably about 40% will have some degree of anxiety and depression if you do a, a screening questionnaire. And similarly, if you, if you give the same questionnaire to carers, you'll see a similar figure. So it's really, really important to be aware of it, to ask the questions, um, and to, to ask for help if, if you do need help. You know, accessing mental health services is difficult at the moment, isn't it? It's very underfunded in the, the NHS. Um, but there are really good online resources, and your, your GP can signpost you to, to, to help if there is an issue there. So please don't, you know, it's normal, it's common. You know, do ask for help if, the, if there's mental health issues. Um, and again, often in a busy clinic, people may not ask you. But heart failure nurses, if you have one, are much, much better at going into this side of things. But... If it is an issue, you know, there's great treatments. Don't, don't put up with it. Do ask for help. And if you're a carer, it's worth asking the people you're caring for. So, and antidepressants are safe if it does come to that. They're, they're absolutely safe if you've got a, a low ejection fraction. There's, there's the SSRIs we tend to use. And that's just the different levels of treatment. So the, there's a lot of low-level, sort of least intrusive ways of affecting so self-help, monitoring, what's called psychoeducation. So there's, there's lots of low-level things, and actually getting in at the lower level is better than waiting for depression, anxiety to sort of spiral and get worse. Okay, uh, sexual dysfunction is, is really common with, with cardiovascular problems, and no one, no one asks about it, but, but it's very common and very treatable, men and women. Um, probably up to about two thirds of men and probably you know, up to 40% of women. So again, there's really effective treatments. There's often a, a sort of vicious psychological spiral that once you, once you fix it, goes away and things improve pretty dramatically. So, so again, you know, don't put up with it. Nearly always it's treatable, so, so do ask for help. And in terms of, you know, is sex dangerous? Is it okay? If, if you can walk a flight of stairs, it's absolutely fine. So, so again, reassurance there. Um, beta blockers are a big cause of sexual dysfunction. And nabivalol has a bit of Viagra-like properties to it. So if you do have it and you're on a beta blocker, sw switch to nabivalol. If you're on ramipril or entresto, switch to candesartan. So switching your drugs makes, it, makes a big difference for that. Okay, vaccines. Um, has, has everyone had their pneumococcal vaccines? Yeah, everyone had the flu vaccine? I think flu is probably more of a risk than COVID at the moment. Um, and, and COVID, you know, you, you still need to have your vaccines. I think the sort of chat outside, everyone's a bit fed up with COVID vaccines and boosters now, but the numbers are going up again. We will see another peak over winter, so, so do have it. 
there's definitely more low level side effects than is actually reported with the boosters. So, you know, you often get general, you know, not bad side effects, but for four or five weeks often get low level issues, swelling, fatigue, tingling, um, and it makes your heart a bit twitchy. So if you're prone to ectopics or arrhythmias, often the, the boosters will just make you a little bit twitchier, but not in, a, not in an unsafe or dangerous way. Okay, um, yeah, quality and diversity, so, so still you know, acro across Europe, across the States, we, you know, if you look at avoidable cardiovascular deaths, that there's, there's clear inequities across the system. And it's, you know, everyone's aware of it. A lot of the national pathway improvement programs have this right at the center of, of what we're trying to do, but it's just highlighting it's, it's better than it was, but it's, it's still a significant issue. Um, okay, so, so then I'm just gonna move a little bit into to looking after yourself. Um, so, so there's a lot you can do as a patient to, to keep an eye on things. So, you know, if you're on medicines, you, you should have your own blood pressure monitor at home. Do, do, do most people have one? And if you don't, Omron's probably the, the best one to have. But thing in the middle at the top is a thing called a cardia device. Does anyone have one of those? So it's got a live core. So you've you can see where they're just putting their, their fingers on that little strip that records an ECG. And actually there's a new one that'll give you multi-lead ECG and you can then email that through to, to your cardiologist. So you, it can sit in your phone case so you can carry it around all day. If you get palpitations, you can record an ECG. You can then send it in to, to your cardiologist. Yeah, Cardia, so K-A-R-D-I-A -A, and it's called a live core. Alive and then COR. Yeah, if you're getting, yeah. It is, but actually, if you've got a pacemaker or defibrillator in, it's monitoring your heart all day, every day anyway, so you probably wouldn't need it. Um, and if you've got a pacemaker or defibrillator, you should have a home monitor. And what that does is every day, any abnormality, it automatically sends through. So, so, so if you've got a device in, you, you wouldn't need that. It's more for people with palpitations that we haven't caught on a 24-hour monitor just to try and catch it. Um, the, the latest Apple Watches are pretty good as well. You can get a reasonable ECG from those. So, so similar. Cardio device is probably a bit better, but the Apple Watches are, are pretty good. Um, that, that thing up there is called an implantable loop recorder. And I think they're brilliant. So, so they just go under the skin. They stay there for two or three years. You have a thing on your phone now, an app, and it records your heart constantly. And if it picks up an abnormality, it just sends it through to your local hospital. So if people are getting palpitations or dizzy spells or blackouts, and they're not getting them that often, that's a great way to, to try and pick up what's going on. And then what's the other thing? And then, yeah, so, so if, if you're on diuretics, you need to have electronic scales. You need to, to weigh yourself same time in the morning. Um, and what other thing have we got there? Yeah, and a, a pulse oximeter is, is sometimes useful, yeah, particularly with COVID and things. Okay, so, so medicines. Uh, how many people are on more than five medicines? Yeah, once you get over five, it's really hard, isn't it? It becomes hard to remember them all. And again, when you're, when you're being seen, just check you need to be on all the medicines you're on. Because doctors are very good at starting medicines. They're, they're very bad at stopping them. So often people are on stomach things for years and years or painkillers they don't need. And so, so again, often blood pressure gets better, particularly if you're if you do all the right sort of things like exercise, you might not need all the medicines you're on. So, so do ask, do I need to be on all these medicines? Because the, the more you're on, the, the less likely you are to take them. And, and the other thing is you need to understand why you're on them. It's much, you're more likely to take them if you understand why you're on them. And pharmacists are a fantastic resource. Chat, chat to your pharmacists in your practice in Boots. They're, they're brilliant at talking you through the medicines. And they'll often say, well, you sure you need that one? Or well, those two, you know, your, 
that gives you a side effect that you start that medicine to treat that side effect gives you another side effect. So they're, they're good at trying to stop some of the, the medicines you don't need. So do, do use your local pharmacist. And again, that's polypharmacy there. Um, avoid some drugs if you have a weak heart. So steroids, non-steroidals, rapamil, some tricyclic antidepressants, all can be bad. So always make sure the drugs you're on are safe for, for your cardiomyopathy. And again, pharmacists are really good at asking that question. Okay, so salt and water. Do, how many people restrict their fluid intake? Yeah, so a few. So, so, so if, if you're not retaining fluid, you don't have to worry about your fluid intake. So you, you only need to monitor how much you take in if you're needing diuretics to keep the edema off and things. If you're well and you're not on diuretics and you're not breathless with swollen ankles, you, you don't need to restrict your water. Um, so, so, so again... So just, just ask the question. And again, salt, you, you, just, you don't need really low salt. It's worse if you have very low salt. You just need not to have too much salt. Um, so so if, you're, if you're using diuretics, it's just input-output. The, the, the more you drink, the more diuretics you have to have to pee out more to have a slightly negative balance. So if you are on diuretics, then a litre and a half is a reasonable fluid restriction. Um, but if it's a hot day, you should have more. Um, so it doesn't have to be too religious unless you're needing lots of diuretics. Um, but if you're well and you're off diuretics and your heart's recovered, you, you don't need to, to monitor how much fluid you're taking. Okay. But again, be, be very, if you are on it, be very careful if in the really hot days, which we have two or three times a year at the moment. Okay. Carers, um, it, it, if you have a significant cardiomyopathy, it's, it's very stressful for the people caring for you. Um, so again, if you're a carer, you know, speak to other carers, get advice and help if you need it. it it's tough on carers as, as well as patients. And, and physical outcomes in carers is significantly worse than, than non-carers. So, so again, be, be cognizant of that. Um, but, but palliative care, it's, it's, always a hard, it's always a hard topic to bring up. Um, and you know, the, the outcome with dilated cognitive is, is really good. Um, but, but at some point, for all of us, you, there's end-of-life discussions, and, and they're often very hard with, with cardiovascular because there's often lots of ups and downs. But it's, it's the kind of thing that, that's always worth having a conversation so people know your views and your opinions. And, and this is what, what we want, really, isn't it? So this is a perfect life where full health, full health till you're 95, and then you, you drop dead in the jacuzzi. That, that's what... <laughs> That's what everyone wants, isn't it? And this is all, this is what drugs and everything we do do. It just pushes things to the right. So you just get slightly better health for a period of time. So that's what everything we're doing is doing. But at some point, there's discussions about you know, where you want to die, how much active treatment you do. And the one thing that's often really important is, is when you turn off the defibrillator. So, you, you know, often... People don't do that early enough, and if you are end of life and having multiple shocks, it's, it's horrible. So, so you know, end of life discussions around defibrillators are, are a really important issue, and again, normally done too late. Okay, what about devices? So this is this is an MRI, and this is. Do you see that wall and that wall are very desynchronous? They're moving at different times. So when you have a weak heart and this dyssynchrony with this left bundle branch block, when you put in one of these resynchronization pacemakers, it treats that dyssynchrony, makes the heart much more efficient in how it beats. So if we go through the different types of devices, so this is a pacemaker. You have a lead going to your right atrium, and then you have another lead that goes into your right ventricle. So that's a simple, normal, dual-chamber pacemaker. And all that does is count your heart rate, and it'll pace your heart if your heart's going too slowly. So that's a backup safety device for, for a slow heart. If you have this resynchronization therapy, you have this third lead that goes down your coronary sinus. And that then goes over and sits alongside the left side of the heart. So you're pacing left and right side together. 
And that's what makes the heart more efficient and more synchronous. So that's a dual chamber pacemaker or a cardiac resynchronization pacemaker. A defibrillator is a pacemaker, but it's a bigger box and a bigger lead, but otherwise it's the same. And it does everything a pacemaker does, but also can treat you if your heart goes quickly. So if you have a very fast heart rate, it can overdrive, pace it or give you a shock. So it's a defibrillator again, can be a dual chamber or a resynchronization one. So same as the pacemaker, but as well as stopping you going too slowly, will stop you going too quickly. Okay, and that's, that's just some of the indications. But basically, if, if your ejection fraction, despite good medical therapy, is under 35%, then you should be considered for a, a defibrillator. Under 30, you probably should have one. 30 to 35 is a bit of a gray area, and it depends on, on other factors, really. Um, is there anyone with an ejection fraction under 30 that doesn't have a defibrillator? Okay, that's a good sign. Okay, and then the, the most extreme treatment for, for cardiomyopathy is, is these sort of left ventricular assist devices and transplantation. Um, pretty rare. That There certainly was only about 100 or so transplants a year in the UK, so it's a very small number that get it. But, but, but in the right population, it's incredibly effective treatment. So outcomes, again, at 10 years with transplant are very, very good. And there's some, there's some new technology coming through that are making organs more available. So the, the key with transplantation is always you have to be referred early. Most people are referred too late. So you have to have single organ involvement. Um, but you have to be pretty symptomatic. So you have to be in and out of hospital on all the right therapy and still getting a lot of symptoms. Um, but if you're under 65 in that setting, transplantation is actually a pretty good and effective treatment. Okay, COVID. Um, so if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy, the, the, your risks aren't too bad. If, if you've had some vaccines, your risks aren't too bad if you have COVID. The, the real risk with COVID actually is age more than anything else um, and respiratory problems. So, so, so okay. Oh, I'm rambling, aren't I? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, new therapies. Um, so gene editing, we, we'll hear about later. The companies are throwing millions and millions into this. It will, it will come through. Very exciting area. Subcutaneous ICDs, um, leadless pacemakers, all kinds of exciting things coming through. So this is just a PA pressure sensor that... that that may come through, they're struggling with NICE with this. Um, just a little bit about cardiovascular health. Um, so, so, you know, if you have a cardiomyopathy and it's well treated, you, you're probably more likely to, to get other issues as you get older. So you've got to look after yourself from the wider cardiovascular side. And probably the number one issue across the Western world is blood pressure. So make sure your blood pressure is under control. And this is just a little bit about coronary artery disease. So this is the progression of furring of your coronary arteries, normal fatty streak all the way through to, to, to basically heart attacks and strokes is the main risk with this narrowing of your arteries. Um, so worth trying to get in there early. It's a Mediterranean diet, don't smoke, exercise, um, and probably lowish threshold for statins. If, if you have narrowings in your arteries, and you don't have chest pain, there is no benefit from a stent. So, so you, stents are symptomatic treatments. They don't affect your outcome. What affects your outcome is healthy lifestyle, statins, aspirin, and things. So there's a, a trial just we ran through St. Thomas's recently where we looked at people with a weak heart and bad coronary artery disease, and we randomized them to stent or no stent, and there was no difference in outcome. So if you have a weak heart, there is no benefit from putting a stent in. It's just a, a symptomatic treatment if you have chest pain. And this is just the difference between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack. The heart attack is a blocked artery, which is what you see here, which you can treat with a stent. So that's a heart attack. That's what statins, healthy darts, will help prevent. Cardiac arrest is where your heart goes so quickly it can't beat. So a heart attack can cause a cardiac arrest. But People with cardiomyopathy that have a cardiac arrest, it's not due to coronary arteries, it's just 
SCAR and electrical short circuits. Okay, and that's the revised. So I'm gonna, so smoking weight, Mediterranean diet has a really good evidence base. So, so it's worth trying to follow a Mediterranean diet. Exercise and activity is really important. Alcohol isn't good for the heart in any quantity. That, that's a myth that doctors use to justify drinking, I think. Um, but a, a, a little bit of alcohol is fine. Um, um, so just last couple of minutes. So the NHS is stretched. It's really struggling at the moment. And there's a lot of things you can do to, to try and get more out of your appointments in the NHS. So, so you need to look after yourself at home, monitor yourself. You need to know how to get back in the system. What's the direct line to the secretary? What's the heart failure nurse's phone number? You need to know what happens if you're pregnant, travel, driving, work. You need advice on all of that. Okay, the constellation should be an equal partnership. Um, have letters, have your clinic letter with you. If the doctor doesn't have your notes, you've got it. Um, have your medication, the names and the doses. Put it all on your phone if you can. If you've got an abnormal ECG, take a picture, have that with you. Have your blood results with you. Write down questions before you go. Um, use charities, use Cardam off the UK. Use your community pharmacists, your district nurses. Um, and don't presume the system's going to work. So, so yeah. So, you know, and it, and it doesn't. It, it does fall down. It's it's so stretched at the moment. So if you have a test, a lot of people go, well, "I didn't hear. It must be fine." It, it doesn't work like that. If you don't know the results of your test, ask for it, because you, you don't know it's fine unless someone tells you it is. So so be proactive when you're when you're seen. Um, and again, you need to know what's my diagnosis. If for dilated cardiomyopathy, is it genetic? What's the underlying cause? Should my family be screened? What's my ejection fraction? Can I have copies of my tests? Can I have a copy of my echo, my halter? You know, it's much safer if you keep all your results than when you go to different hospitals, everyone can see what's going on. You know, ask what's the outlook? Can I stop my drugs? Are there any clinical trials going on I can be part of? You know, if you live in Portsmouth and travel up to Bart's, you know, often you can have a hub and spoke. You don't need to traipse up to London. Can I have my test done locally? I don't have to keep coming all the way up. It's expensive. A um, bit of advice on exercise. What can I do? How do I do it? So exercise, you need, once you're over 50, you need to keep your muscle mass up. So you need some resistance work as well as aerobic and stretching. That's really important. So, so ask all the, and then what are the local support groups? So, you know, write this down before you go and ask all these questions. Okay, great. Well, look, I've, I've rambled on for too long. Sorry about that. But it's a great pleasure to talk to you all. So, yeah, have a healthy lifestyle. Be proactive. Do all of those things. You'll, you'll get more out of the health system. And understand your disease, the causes, and the medicines you're on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Can I be cheeky and throw in two questions? One is, you talk about have an ejection fraction. Do you mean have or had? So, you know, off, many of us started with low numbers that have then come high. Uh, and second is, how different are the outcomes depending on which team or which specialist you've got? Should one be trying to get um, cardiologists with a particular interest in one's flavor of DCM or whatever it happens to be? Or is general cardiac services very similar outcomes? Yeah, good. Yeah, really good questions. So I'll, I'll do the second one first. So I think if you have a cardiomyopathy, you, you will do better if you're within a, a cardiomyopathy service. Um, and it can be linked to, 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 to your local district hospital. You know, it can be a hub and spoke model. But you will have access to the newer treatments. You, you know, it, it's quite a niche area. And unless you're doing it all the time, you're you're probably not getting the, the best. So I, I think everyone with cardiomyopathy should be under or at least linked to a cardiomyopathy service. And I think the outcomes probably are better if that's the case. Um, and then in terms of ejection fractions, so, so yes, yeah, so a lot of people die to cardiomyopathy with the right medicines significantly improve. And that, you know, your prognosis goes with that outlook gets much better. Um, but but we, we hit the drugs are based on your presentation ejection fraction. So if it's below 40 to start with, you get all those drugs and you tend to keep on them. 
But if it's 20 and it goes up to 40, you don't need the defibrillator or the pacemaker or things like that. Yeah. I'll stay, over, I'll stay over this side for now and then I'll go down to the other end of the room. Um, I uh, just want to ask a question regarding ejection fraction. Um, I've, I've got an ICD. I'm on all the medications that you said, Interesto, Gabba, Lifazine, nearly seven different medications. For some reason, my ejection fraction has always been between 25 and maximum 28. Is there anything else that could increase that or you, you could recommend that I could suggest that to my heart failingness? Yeah, no, good question. So, so, so sometimes, you know, if your ejection fraction is stable, it doesn't mean that the medicines aren't working because the, the most likely thing is if you weren't on all of those, it would have been getting worse and worse and worse. So, you know, you don't know what's going on in the background. So, so actually a stable ejection fraction is, is still a positive thing, truthfully. Um, the, the only things that improve how long you live and your ejection fraction are those four drugs. So Tresto, beta blockers, aplerinone and dapagliflozin, and the ICDs that there is nothing else that improves your ejection fraction or makes you live longer. Um, so they're, they're the only things that, that we have at the moment. Um, I mean, if, if your heart rate's very quick, despite a good dose of beta blocker, maybe avambradine helps a little bit, but, but, but probably not a great deal. So, so no, I think, um, but a stable, stable ejection fraction is okay, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about beta blockers. Um, I have um, a sister who also suffers from dilated cardiomyopathy. We're both in our late 60s, and she has recently started to struggle very seriously with her short-term memory. And I understand that there is possibly a side effect of using a beta blocker and effects on short-term memory. Is this something that she should be investigating? Yeah, so... so, so so, so it, it, there's many bits to that. Um, the, you know, I, I don't think it, most of the time it doesn't have significant effects. There, there, there is some anecdotal evidence it can make it a little bit worse. The, the benefits of beta blockers, if you have to cut them off, they probably outweigh that. Um, but could, so, could, could she take a different beta block or, yeah. or an alternative medication that might be So, so, so absolutely. So, so some beta blockers are, are less centrally acting. So, so it's, it's very reasonable to, to see if you can have a beta blocker that's, that's less centrally acting. And again, and nivivalol is often very good. So, so certainly worth, but, but the other thing is it's worth going through a, a proper memory clinic because there's a... Well, she doesn't live in the UK, first of all. She lives in Spain, and so yeah. she's kind of entering the system there. Yeah. And there's a little bit of a language issue because she's not fluent in Spanish. So quite what's available there locally, I don't know. So yeah. um, we have to find out. But I did actually have another question, if I may. Is that possible? Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. One more? Yeah. So um, this, again, is relating to, to my sister rather than, than me because... Um, she has been urged quite a few times to have the defibrillator fitted, which she is um, re uh, resisting uh, quite considerably. Um, and um, she hasn't been given sh an MRI. Is it important that she should have this MRI as a diagnosis for a decision as to whether it's necessary for her to have the defibrillator or not? Yes, yeah, so, so all, all the trials for defibrillators are based on ECHO rather than MRI. So if you're on the right medicines for three months and on echo, your, your EF is 30 or under, then that's all you need to, to warrant a, a defibrillator. MRI is still a useful thing to have because it often shows, so MRI shows scar, nothing else shows scar. And it'll often show you particular scar patterns that might give you a different underlying diagnosis or might point you towards a specific gene. And also, if you see a lot of scar, your sudden death risk is higher. So it would be even more of a, a push towards having a defibrillator. But, but it wouldn't be a deciding factor as to whether it's okay for her not to have it or she should have it, basically, is what you're saying. Well, I think if she's, 
if she, it depends on all the other factors, but if she's in a slightly grey area, yeah. uh, an MRI does give you, because the scar is increasingly, we, we know it's a really important risk for, for sudden death. So if, you know, if you did an MRI and saw a lot of scar, you'd push much harder for, for a defibrillator. And okay. if you saw non-sustained fast runs on a monitor, again, you'd, you'd push harder for a defibrillator. Okay. Thank but you most people with a defibrillator don't ever use it. So, so we put them in. Yeah, well, we, we're pushing hard, but she's resisting hard. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned, I think, quite rightly, that people find it very difficult to talk about sex and cardiomyopathy. Um, and you mentioned two drugs that, for men, one being a beta blocker and one being an ACE inhibitor, that are probably more helpful than other drugs in the same class. Yeah. Um, could you repeat what those drugs were? Yeah, so, so beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are a big cause of, of erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So for beta blockers, the, you should switch to nabivalol, mm -hmm. um, and that has, it has some Viagra-like properties, actually. Okay. So, and then your ACE inhibitor, you should switch to candesartan. To, what's that second one? Candesartan. Sartan. Yeah. Thank no. you very much. And then the other thing with, with erectile dysfunction in men is it, it, there's always a psychological vicious cycle. So, so using Vagra or Vagra like um, medicines often breaks that cycle and then, and then things improve. And Vagra is safe. The only thing it can do is, is just drop your blood pressure a little bit. So you just have to be careful if you've got low blood pressure with all the medicines you're on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so I've got a few hands waiting. I'll do a couple more at this end, and then I think there's some people who are waiting patiently at the other end. Thank you. I have a question about MRI. Um, you said, because you talked a lot about, obviously, why you have an MRI and the benefits, maybe as against the, an echo. Um, I'm told my ICD is not compatible with MRI, and I just wondered whether there's uh, any plans in the future to make ICDs MRI compatible so that we can undertake those interventions. Yeah. How, how long ago was your well, ICD? I've, I've had it since 2014, but I've just had one last year implanted again, and I couldn't have an MRI with it. Yeah, so, so I've got to be careful here. Pretty much everyone with an ICD can have an MRI. So, so the, the latest ICDs are all MRI compatible, but even mm. those that aren't actually if you program them the right way and do a short scan, you can scan. So, so pretty much everyone with an MRI can be scanned. Well, you can certainly, you know, some centers are better at this than other centers. So, so Barts and Thomas's both are good at scanning pretty much anyone with an ICD. I don't know the centres outside London. I don't know where, where you live. But there, there will be centres that I would have thought could, could scan you. The, the other aspect, though, is sometimes you get sort of artefact from the, the defibrillator. So you, you might not get the best pictures is a, is a different thing. Hi, Joey. Um, thank you for the talk today. Um, I had a quite heated discussion recently um, with a... I believe a GP with a specialism in cardiology uh, about dap dapagliserin. Um, he um, was adamant that there's not enough evidence um, to show that it does help people with heart conditions. And I know it's not a new medication, but it's relatively new for treating people with heart conditions. Can you um, talk a little bit more about the efficacy and how much it is helping? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can send you the slides if you want there's fantastic evidence for it there's there's big clinical trials with tens of thousands of patients that clearly show mortality and admission is, is reduced but by about 30 percent so, so outcome data is really good there's also big registries that show similar efficacy across the whole range of ejection fraction there's and there's masses of evidence from the old diabetic trials as well so there's yeah he probably needs to to do a bit more studying, I think. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so it's going, it's, it's going through. Um, at the moment, it's 
for, 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 for the moment it's only if your EF is under 40%. Um, but the data is there for all EFs, so, so that probably will change. And there's a bit about GFRs, which is nonsense, really. So if your, your GFR has to be over 30 for dapaglyphosin, but it can be over 20 for empaglyphosin. So if your GFR sits in that range, you can use empaglyphosin now. Oh, <clears throat> good morning, Jerry. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, my question is about injection fractions, and I noticed that our um, keynote speaker um, increased her injection fraction from 18% to 50 to 55%. Now, you mentioned that you could probably get a 15% increase in EF through drugs. Her increase seems to be much larger than that. So, first question is, does age have anything to do with improving injection fraction? And B, um, if I went to a gym, for example, and I had a flabby muscle in my body, I could work on it and exercise it. Should we be doing that with flabby heart muscles? Thank you. <laughs> Very good question. So, so um, yeah, yeah, if you look at all comers, the average injection fraction will go up about 15%. There's definitely a group of, as it were, super responders, and it's it's not uncommon. So there's, you know, and it, and it can take up to about two years to, to get the full recovery. And it depends slightly what's triggered it and what the underlying cause is. So there's a, a group that present in fast atrial fibrillation that have very weak hearts. If you just get them out of the atrial fibrillation, they, they often normalize when you have this tachycardia-induced sort of LV dysfunction, that often completely normalizes. If you have a myocarditis, a viral infection that gives you your cardiomyopathy, that often normalizes really, really well. If you have no scar in your heart, again, you often get a, a better response. So there's definitely a group that, that, that normalize incredibly well, actually. Um, and it, it, it's those factors. Age isn't such a factor, actually. Um, but, but it's probably a little bit of a factor. And, and yes, exercise does does help you live a little bit longer, probably, when you have a, a dilated cardiomyopathy. So it, it, does it improve your ejection fraction? Maybe. But it certainly improves outcomes. But probably through reducing strokes and heart attacks more than actually affecting the cardiomyopathy itself. But there's a little bit of evidence it might make the heart a bit stronger. Right. Hello. Hello. Um, near the beginning, you, when you were talking about CT scans, did you say the uh, dye that's put in is aluminium? Or yeah. was that something else? So, so there's, there's different dyes. So if you have an MRI scan, they give a dye called gadolinium. Um, that's the name of the dye for MRI. But for CT, it's iodine-based um, contrast agents. Um, but, but there's no aluminium in it. Right, uh, it just, um, my daughter, she's had three now, and after each one, she has a, a skin reaction. Um, is that, she's uh, suffered from eczema in yeah. her life, which at the moment is being, it's being suppressed by medication. Um, but after each scan, um, the skin is getting worse. And that's so C I, CT rather than MRI. Yeah. So what, what you can do is, is take steroids for a week before the scan. That's the best way to, to mm. stop that happening. So you can have oral steroids for, for a week before the scan would be the best thing to do. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I'll just make my way back over here one moment. Hi. Um, do you think everybody with DCM should have genetic testing? Yeah, it's a good, really good question. Um, so so there's, there's two reasons to genetically test, I guess. So I think anyone that has fat first-degree relatives should be genetically tested, um, unless it's clearly not genetic because you've you know, had Herceptin or a toxic drug or something. But if, if there's a chance it's genetic, I think 
I think probably if you have relatives, you should have genetic testing. Um, my cardiologist never suggested it, and she just kind of said with my DCM, well, we can't find a cause for it, so it was probably an infection. Yeah, um, yeah. I've got children and grandchildren. That's yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it is. The, and the yield's much better than it used to be because we, we found a whole lot of extra genes recently. So I, at a personal level, I think, it's, I think it is the right thing. If you look at the Genomics England and the guidelines, they're still saying, restricting it slightly to where there's definitely other people in the family or where it's one of these arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. So, so, so you, there's local preference, and I'm, I think it's a useful thing to do. In terms of national guidance, it's still not that everyone should have it. But, but I think if you, if you have any kind of rhythmogenic nature to your cardiomyopathy, then you should because particular genes carry a, a worse outlook. So, so even if you don't have family, if you've got scar and, and changes in your heart rhythm, I think you definitely should. Thank um, you. But, but even if you're not gene tested, it, it, it's worth the rest of the family being screened. Thanks very much, Jerry. It uh, was a fantastic talk. Um, uh, you talked an awful lot about well-being and looking after yourself. My question is uh, fatigue. I suffer from um, real extreme fatigue, whether that was because I was quite hyperactive before the diagnosis, I'm not sure, but I do uh, suffer an awful lot. But I just wanted to know if there was any um, extra things that we should be doing or I could be doing that could reduce this fatigue so that I could uh, get more out of my life. Yeah, I, I think fatigue is really common. Anyone else suffer from? Yeah. So, so, so a, f a few bits about fatigue. It's really common. Um, if you've had COVID, the, the, the post-COVID syndrome affects far more people than we realize. So if fatigue has got worse since COVID, that can go on for years. Um, and the key with that is not to overexercise because that prolongs the recovery. Um, check your vitamin D levels. Most people are low in vitamin D. That's an easy fix. Check your iron levels. It is a treatable thing for fatigue. Um, try switching your beta blocker because often the beta blocker is contributing to fatigue. Um, that's probably all you can do. Um, but it's worth looking at all of those. Yeah, and that's a very good point. You can try splitting your tablets half the dose morning and evening. Um, and that often works well if blood pressure is an issue and you get dizzy when you stand up. Splitting the tablets helps. Yeah, so to try, try those things, um, but but it's really common. Um. Hello, oh, my hello. son's got it. Um, can you have more than one cause for DCM? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So um, you can you, you can have a genetic cause, but then you could have a tachycardia that makes things worse. You can have genetic and a viral myocarditis. Right. You can have genetic and toxic drugs. So yeah, so, so and probably the commonest other factor is hypertension. Um, so so, so the, and I think there's certainly a lot of people where it's the combination that gives you the issues. So you have a, a genetic predisposition and then you have poorly controlled blood pressure for a while. So yeah, no, definitely can have two causes. And subsequently, does the cause affect which drug that he's treated on? No, no, no. The, the sort of treatment for reduced ejection fraction, it doesn't matter what the cause of the reduced ejection fraction. There's a few differences there in that if there's a treatable cause, you would treat that as well. So if you're hypothyroid, you give thyroid hormones. If you are got sarcoid or lupus or something like that, you'd give steroids. Um, so there's specific treatable causes that you have additional treatment. But then the treatment for the low ejection fraction is the same for, for no matter what the cause is. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I, I can see four hands over here. We've got about, about two minutes each, I think. So I'll quickly come over this way. And hopefully we can get through all of those before we're out of time.
Good morning. Um, thank you for your presentation. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, my wife's been left fluid intake um, on reduced fluid intake, um, despite being having discharge from the uh, nurses. Um, and also, my second question as well, perhaps at the same time, plays into it. How often should the ejection fraction be checked or monitored? Because uh, currently we are um, discharged. And, and do, you, do you know what the last ejection fraction was? Um, it was 43 and went from 33. Yeah, so, 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 so fluid intake, are you on any diuretics? Or? No. No. So just, I, I'd be fairly relaxed about fluid, just don't, don't worry. But if you find as you drink more, you're swelling up a bit, then you'll have to restrict a little bit. But you probably don't need it if you're not on diuretics and your EF's over 40. Um, and, and I think even if you're stable on maximum medical therapy, you should be seen by a specialist once a year, and that's national guidance. Um, so you should be reviewed. You should have an up-to-date echo maybe every year or two or, or earlier if you get new symptoms. Um, Thank because, you. Because, you know, if you haven't got a defib and you're well but it's dropped to 30, then you'd, you'd want to know that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, with regard to the lifestyle changes, you mentioned earlier avoiding high altitudes. Uh, what do you mean by high altitudes? Do you, are you referring to flights? No, most people are fine to, to fly. That, that's very specific, personalised advice. Um, I'm thinking of sort of, you know, significant mountain levels of, uh, yeah, so if you're going up to base camp of Everest and things in the, yeah. Yeah, no, and you know, skiing and things is fine. It, it depends. If you're very symptomatic, then you can get a, a fitness to fly and an altitude test, but most people are fine, actually. Thanks for a very professional presentation. Obviously, the day-to-day -day management of uh, th these uh, problems hinges very much on the ejection factor. Uh, the problem is knowing what your EF is, is dependent at the moment on having an echocardiogram at a hospital. But I understand that there is in development some modified stethoscope using artificial intelligence to enable uh, some sort of indication of uh, your, your ejection factor. So obviously that would be much more practical than going to a hospital. I think the Lancet Digital has done a, an article on this. Have you got any understanding of this? Yeah, so te technology is, is incredible. There's all kinds of very exciting things coming through. There's there's home ultrasound devices you can set up and do so. There's also these stethoscopes that measure lung water and impedance to look for early signs of decompensation. So there's, yeah, and there's things that just use the, the noises to, to give you a whole array of the, the sort of AI generated algorithms now that are incredible. Um, the, the problem slightly is they're based on big data across massive populations. And when you get big data, you get very impressive results. But it's not always accurate for that particular individual. And in that individual, it's often changes rather than an absolute value that, that tells you things. So there's a bit of sort of fine tuning to it. But, but in the next five years, you'll see a lot of this, particularly as the workforce is, is really struggling. So anything that takes scanning away from the workforce is, is going to be really helpful, actually. Hello. Um, I have um, DCM with left bundle branch block. Um, is there anything in particular you could um, tell me about that um, that I need to be aware of? Yes, yeah, so it's a common, so, so about 25% maybe of people DCM will have left bundle branch block. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few things about it. If, if your EF sticks below 35 on the right medicines, you do really well from the sort of resynchronization pacing. It makes a big difference if you have left bundle branch block. And because left bundle branch is just a bit of delay in the electrics, it's worth just having the halter monitors done every now and then just to check there's not delay in other bits of the electrics. Um, 
uh, but, and also the, the EF range is different if you have left bundle branch block. So normal is a little bit lower. Um, so they're, they're the main things with it, but it's common. It's okay. Common. Thank you.